A couple of announcements. Uh, that was one, answered prayer. Second, the uh, congregational meeting this Sunday. Uh, that will be immediately following morning morning service. Then uh, the Camparete garage sale. Uh, anything that you think Jeff needs, they can sell over there and take care of uh, fi- uh, transportation uh, issues for the camp. And also the pastor's conference coming up. One of the things that goes on with the pastor's conference, especially this one, but I just thought I would give you a little insight as to what goes on, let people know what we've tried to do, what I've tried to do in the, in the I think it's seven years now that we've been hosting it, is to take different distinctives of Chafer Seminary and to emphasize those as, a, as the theme of each particular year. Sometimes we have people who uh, present papers that are um, not on topic simply because sometimes it's difficult to find men who are, who've done enough uh, serious work and are prepared to address a topic uh, or an aspect of a topic that's, that's really on target. And sometimes, like this year, we have a couple of people who had a topic that they wanted to talk about for some time, and some things they're really they've really been working on in their uh, churches, and so they wanted to uh, be able to present uh, some of that. And that's particularly true with Bruce Einspar's uh, presentation on on uh, uh, developing a man's a ministry for men in a local church. He's been really developing a lot on that in the last few years so, and asking about doing a presentation so that fit with the topic real well this year. So that's, that's one aspect. Also, uh, David Roseland is going to be doing, I think, a, an excellent job going through the Pauline epistles, those sections of the Pauline epistles, we tend to sort of skip over the closing where he's, t- he's talking about say hi to Bill and John and Fred and um, pray about this and pray about that, the more personal aspects to develop uh, an understanding of that the, sort of the personal dynamic uh, of the pastoral ministry, something that hasn't been uh, been developed too much before, and he uh, he was uh, very much interested in developing that that topic. So that's sort of the dynamic that goes on in putting this together. Uh, sometimes uh, we have a specific, uh, a well known topic like creation or evolution. Times we've had topics we've had to pretty much do in house because there aren't too many other people who are doing. Uh, in-depth work on sanctification from a Chaferian, uh, Schofieldian uh, framework. And so that's why we had most of our own people doing presentations a couple of years ago. And the same is, is pretty much true this time, except for our keynote speaker, because one of the distinctives that we have that that is true for West Houston Bible Church uh, Sugarland Bible Church, Grace Bible Church, um, National Capital Bible Church, Brack Church, is our distinctive on teaching. And I've come to learn over the years that you get a lot of people who will say a lot of things and say you're this, say you're that, and whatever. But what seems to really divide what we do from everybody else is the fact that on Sunday morning, we don't do anything different from other nights in terms of communicating the word because we believe that the pastoral ministry is to teach the word. And as we've gone through Acts, I've emphasized this, that Acts is about, all about, you have those words, I mentioned it Tuesday night, Caruso for proclamation of the gospel, uh, Evangelizo for giving the good news or proclaiming the good news, and those words are almost always used in relation to the gospel. But didasco is related to explaining the content of Scripture, and that's how you equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And that's the foundation of the pastoral ministry. But what happens in most pulpits in most churches today, and I'm not intending to be negative and critical, uh, everybody makes their choice, but it doesn't really produce people in the pew who are knowledgeable beyond a first grade or kindergarten level in terms of what the Bible teaches. 
and therefore we have pews that are filled with babies. So that's that's the thrust of this this particular uh, conference, and uh, especially focusing on things related to music, which is why we have Scott coming, is because we have a, a lot of people. Music is really emphasized in Scripture, as you all know, because of what I've taught. But unfortunately, we have a lot of small churches, 100, 100 150 people, uh, and sometimes for music people, some congregations are musically challenged, especially the ones that have 40 or 50 people. And so they need a lot of encouragement and creativity and uh, ideas and how to develop music in those congregations and how to do it right and to resist the incredible pressure that some pastors feel or get from people in their congregations that if we would just sing all those Christian choruses like all the other churches, we'd have young people in our church. And if I've heard that once, I've heard it enough to retire and be a wealthy man. But the reason people don't, if people come to church because you're singing Christian ditties, then you don't want those people in your church. Because the people who come for Christian ditties don't come to learn the Word of God. And I learned that as a young pastor. They want one or the other, but they don't want both. And there may be one or two out of 10 million that do, but trust me, that's about what the percentage is. People either want, even, either want to know the Word of God and grow spiritually, or they want to entertain themselves and impress them, their, themselves with their emotions by singing Christian choruses. And sadly, that's pretty much the way it is, although people who like to impress themselves with their Christian courses would not like that representation, but that's pretty much what it is. So that's where we are. So we have to strengthen our pa- young pastors so they understand how, how to stay the, stay the path. Well, let's, uh, that's a long introduction. Let's open in prayer. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer, then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that we have the ministry given to us by you, and we have a responsibility to conduct that ministry according to the standards set forth in your word, the way it was practiced in the scriptures and the way it is taught in the scriptures, that uh, how we do what we do is as important as what, as, as what we do, and the content of our teaching is important but so is the means and the methods we use to uh, communicate the truth of your word. Father, we're thankful for all the young pastors that we have that get involved with the conference, Uh, men like Jeremy Thomas in Fredericksburg and David Roseland in uh, Preston City, uh, Clay Ward at Plainroma Bible Church and many others, and we pray that you would strengthen them. And we know that they're involved in training other young men and we pray that, that that would continue and that we might be able to faithfully pass on uh, your, what we have learned and what we have taught to the next generation. Father, now as we study your word tonight, may we be again encouraged and strengthened by, by your word, by the truth of it, that we might continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. Okay, we're in Romans 8. Romans 8, and we are in a fa- fabulous section dealing with um, future things. And the key word, it, it, sometimes you, run, you work your way through a passage, and you're studying, you're reading. Sometimes in English, you can actually pick off a key word because there's really very little other way to translate it than the way it is being translated. Oftentimes in English, though, you find translators follow a rather artificial English style uh, rule, which is don't use the same word very often within a paragraph. Uh, Try to have stylistic variation and vocabulary uh, variation. But sometimes the Holy Spirit didn't quite read the English rule book, and so he uses the same word three or four times in two or three sentences, and he's making a point. And as you read through this section in Romans chapter 8, uh, we're going to, I'm going to start in verse 18. We studied uh, some parts of 18 through 21 uh, last time, but this time we're going to make it down to about verse, uh, through verse uh, 
827, just before we get to a well-known promise at 828. And the key word that we see is a word that shows up first in, in verse uh, 22. For we know that the whole creation groans. The whole creation groans in verse 22 and verse 23. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves. So we've got the creation groaning, and we're groaning. And then if you skip down a little bit more, uh, when it talks about uh, prayer, uh, verse 26, that the Holy Spirit helps us in, uh, or assists us actually in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with, and it's poorly translated in the King James it it's, shouldn't be translated with groans which cannot be uttered. That's, that's a uh, bad translation, but it's, it's um, unutterable groans. So there's no audible sound. But we have that word groan again. So three times we've got groaning going on. Now, you always thought that as a Christian, you were supposed to have happiness and joy of the Lord in your heart and always uh, happy about everything and joyful about everything. And, and as the song says, have the joy, joy, joy down in my heart. But here we have one of the central chapters on the spiritual life in the whole Bible that almost every knowledgeable Christian recognizes is one of the greatest chapters in Scripture. And it focuses on our our phase two, our Christian life experience as what? Groaning. And not any of us who've been around for very long should recognize how true that is. On the one hand, we have a great joy and happiness because we know what our eternal destiny is, and we have stability in our soul in the midst of crises and in the midst of difficulty. But there are difficulties. There are challenges. There are health challenges. There are emotional challenges. There are physical, monetary challenges. There's challenges that we face dealing with people. We have uh, all kinds of systems testing in terms of our employment and employers, and we have people testing in terms of the same, same kind of thing. And it goes on and on and on because as we studied in the last two lessons in dealing with the uh, reasons and categories for suffering. We live in a fallen world, and so the world is corrupt, and all of the systems are corrupt. There's no ideal form of government until Jesus returns. And when Jesus returns, because he is the God-man and he is absolute perfection, and he will be at the head of the kingdom there will be a perfect government and perfect politics. But even in a world with a perfect government, with a perfect governor, who will be the king of kings and lord of lords, and a perfect uh, system of laws, there will be an untold number of people who at the end of a thousand years will reject all of that, will claim that it is all wrong, that, uh, that Jesus Christ is just out to, uh, to uh, uh, destroy all of the poor people, and to take advantage of all of the old people, to take away all of their Medicare and all of their Medicaid and uh, everything else, the same thing we hear today, is going to be leveled against the perfect rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is because of the corruption the, of the sin nature on all of those that are born during the thousand-year period of the millennial kingdom. So this time of corruption, even though there's a partial reversal of the curse, and it's rolled back to some degree during the millennial kingdom, the curse does not end until we get to the destruction of the present heavens and the, new, and the present earth, and God creates the new heavens and the new earth. There is not going to be perfection really until we get to that time. So until then, if you're a human being and you're fallen and you're living in a, with a corrupt body and you're living with corrupt sinners and you're living in corrupt systems and working in corrupt systems, we're going to groan. And that groaning is uh, the creation itself groans because it's under corruption and we're going to groan. And it's not wrong to admit it. There are a lot of Christians that think, well, it's wrong for me to complain. Well, yes, complaining is wrong. 
But you can complain to God. Oh, no, no, I don't want to tell God that I'm, how hard it is. Well, don't you think he knows? He's omniscient. If you're not telling him, you're not being honest with yourself. That's, that's one problem Christians have is they don't, you can't face and handle the problems you're facing if you're not willing to admit what those problems are. And if you're not willing to admit the fact that your faith wavers at times, read the Psalms. Read all of those lament psalms. When David is groaning, it's the same word. The word that's used for groaning is a word that means to mourn or to lament something. And you read through uh, the psalms and you read all of these passages where David is, is groaning about his circumstances, the people that are opposed to him, the enemies that he has, the situations that he's going through. And he always comes back to the Lord. But before he gets focused on the Lord and gets his mental attitude straight and moves forward, he's always honest with God about the negatives of of his situation. He doesn't try to gloss over it. And we can't get anywhere if we're not dealing with reality as it is and not thinking, oh, I shouldn't feel this way because I'm a Christian. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have these thoughts because I'm a Christian. I shouldn't hate my job because I'm a Christian. I shouldn't uh, have trouble uh, and have anxiety over going to work with the people I'm going to work with because I'm a Christian. Yeah, you're a Christian, but you're a fallen sinner, and you've got to grow through that, and we all have to grow through that until we face the honesty of those and be honest with ourselves and with God. We're not really going to be able to maximize the solutions that God has for us. So I, I'm calling this lesson tonight. Wait a minute. I, did I, how did I lose that there? I bent over and turned myself off. The doctrine of groaning and intercession. The doctrine of groaning and and intercession. Romans eight seventeen. that should be 17 to 26. 17 to 26. Let's just do a little review. We touched on these last time. We'll close of the last section. Uh, if children, and if is a first class condition, if and we are children, heirs also. Every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is a child of God, techna. We are children of God, in the plural it's technoi. Heirs also, Heirs of God, that, that describes every single believer at the instant of salvation. We are regenerate. We are born again, so we're born into the family of God. We are adopted into the family of God so that we are uh, going to be trained as children of God. We're heirs of God, but the next category is distinct. It's fellow heirs, joint heirs with Christ if we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified uh, with him. Now, the next verse, one I talked about considerably in the last couple of weeks, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, I went back and took a look at this verse a little more because I've just had trouble understanding this concept of how this glory is revealed in us. And it is not a preposition in, which can also be instrumental. It's not, it, ace can have a nuance of within us, but this preposition in the Greek usually indicates movement. And many times it's, it's the preposition that's used if you're going somewhere. If you say, I'm going to go to Dallas, you would use the preposition ace to indicate direction and movement toward a goal. Uh, that's how this is used. It, it, it's, a, it's a preposition that suggests uh, some kind of uh, movement and direction. And so what is being moved here toward us is glory. Now, isn't that an interesting concept? The, con- the context we're talking about here, again, is suffering. Every believer is going to engage in some sort of suffering. It may be mild. It may be uh, maximized. It depends on the circumstances. But if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and at any level trying to apply doctrine in the devil's world, you're going to face opposition and hostility at one level. That's what this suffering is. It's not necessarily overt persecution. It is just facing adversity and difficulty in life related to your obedience to the Word of God. 
For I consider that the sufferings, that is, whatever adversity or difficulty or challenges I face today in terms of applying the word, they're really not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed toward us. And what what Paul is saying here is that if you and I are growing to spiritual maturity and we are applying the word then God is doing something in our life in terms of bringing glory to himself. And that's accomplished by conforming us to the image of his Son. He mentions this in verse 29. So if you have your Bible opened, look, just skip down in Romans 8 down to verse 29. We'll get into this more next time, dealing with all these words that Calvinists think mean that we actually have a fatalistic God, but we, that's not that's because they've distorted the terms. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Predestined simply means to set a goal ahead of time. It means to set a destination beforehand. If I get up in the morning and decide I need to take a trip to Austin, I am going to predestine Austin. I am setting Austin as my destination ahead of time. So the prefix pre means before, so ahead of time, I set that destiny. Jesus Christ's character is our destiny. He is conforming us to that goal. That's the direction God's moving us. How do we become conformed to his character? It is one of the ways God uses is suffering. We've studied in Hebrews chapter uh, 2 where even the Son of God had to learn obedience by the things that he suffered. It's not that he was disobedient, but he had to go through that process. As he suffered, he grew and matured spiritually in his humanity. And so what what Paul is articulating here in verse 18 is that the sufferings are not that important. Get your eyes off of yourself. Quit being self-absorbed with the people that don't like you, with the difficulty of the job, with the fact that... um, that you're getting older and it's more difficult to read the fine print you need to read when you're trying to go through things or whatever else it is. We all go through these changes. Life gets difficult, and work in this fallen world gets difficult, and we sometimes have uh, overt spiritual opposition from people who know we're Christians and are just out to get us. But that difficulty that we go through is nothing compared to what God's producing in us. That's essentially what he's saying here. Because uh, something is happening. When we're walking by the Spirit, God is directing his power, his character. And often the word glory is used, as I pointed out before, as a, as a synonym for the entire essence of God. So the the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the essence of God that will be revealed in us. Now, does that passage seem to make a little more sense? God is creating his character in us. And so we have another verse. uh, I pointed this out when we went through Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There the term glory of God is used as a summary term for the essence of God. We're fallen short of the essence of God. It's used the same way here. Uh, The glory that is going to be revealed in us is really the essence of God that is being revealed in us, his character. We're being transformed into that character from grace to to grace, as, as Paul said. So it is a matter of spiritual growth. And that is revealed in us. It's moving to us, in a sense, and being produced in us as we learn to handle the suffering and as we go forward. Now, Paul is going to add an additional explanation. See, this verse, verse 18, started off with a four. Everything that comes between this verse, verse uh, 18, and verse 27 is helping us to understand this whole issue of suffering with him in verse 17. 
So we're learning to suffer with him so that we may be what? Glorified with him. And the way in which we're glorified with him is manifesting his glory in us, his character in us. Is that clear? It's a little bit, I bet nobody here's ever read it that way before. And I think that brings it out in a, in a much clearer fashion. And as I was going through this today, working on that preposition, it, it, that suddenly struck me that that's, that's what's going on here is this kind of, it's a directional thing with that preparation, pre, uh, preposition ace. Now we're going to go to the next step in this explanation in, in, um, in verse 21. I don't know why that box showed up. I'm going to take it out now. There we go. Back to verse 20 and 21. For the creation was subject to futility. The creation is subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Now, this is another uh, verse. I talked about it last time. It goes back to understanding what happened when the fall occurred, what happened when Adam sinned. As a result of his sin, the whole creation came under condemnation. So it, it, it is subjected. And this phrase, in hope, is a phrase that should be understood in terms of a reference point. A reference point. It's a dative of reference. We have this, uh, the word's uh, uh, elpis there, but it's in the dative case. Dative can be used with, with 17, 18, 19, depending on the grammar you look at, different shades of meaning or different nuances. A uh, dative case is used to indicate the indirect object, is u- used to indicate um, uh, means or instrument or location. But one of the things that it indicates is reference with regard to something or with reference to something. Uh, so God subjected it with reference to hope. Now, this opens up an interesting line of thinking because we have to stop and we have to say, what is the focal point of hope all through the Scripture? As I say all the time, it's not just a wishful optimism. Like we wake up uh, today and the weather was beautiful and gorgeous and the weather is going to probably be beautiful and gorgeous tomorrow, and we hope it will be on Saturday because we want to go fishing and or hunting or some outdoor activity, but it could rain, and we could have another day like Monday again and just get everything washed out. But we're not sure. We know that the uh, weather guessers are say one thing, but it can often change within 24 hours. So hope, that's, that's how we use hope, but that's not how God uses hope. Hope is a confident expectation of a certain future reality. We're certain, we're assured, we're confident. We know something is going to happen in the future. Now, God subjected, he, he brought this judgment, this curse upon uh, the universe, the physical material universe, because... He's focused on where he's going to take everything in terms of the future destiny. That's hope brings in the future. Subjected it is the past. He subjected it because he understood in his omniscience that in order to bring about the solution to sin and all the corruption that entered into the universe because of evil, he had to bring everything under judgment and that this eventually would be necessary in order to bring everything to its ultimate resolution and the destruction of evil. That's one of the difficult things about solving the problem of evil is that we don't have a mind that can comprehend all of the bits of data that God can comprehend. And he recognized that that the pervasiveness of evil and the pervasive destruction of evil is so great that uh, only his plan could ultimately redeem the planet from the corruption of sin. Now, this is interesting because the word redemption is almost always used in Scripture of redeeming people from sin. It has that idea of purchasing, paying the purchase price of a slave. The focus of redemption is almost always people except in this passage. In this passage, we're not redeeming people. We're redeeming the material, physical universe from the corruption 
of sin, and it didn't happen at the cross. The cross is what allows it to happen. It isn't accomplished until when? When is this, this redemption of creation going to come into effect? At the end of the millennial kingdom. Not at the beginning of the kingdom, but at the end of the kingdom, because it's only when the present earth is finally uh, destroyed, the new heavens and new earth are created, that we have a creation that is free from corruption. So the creation is subjected to futility for a purpose. It's not random. You don't have to understand it. I don't have to understand it. I don't have to explain One of the most difficult things I find as a pastor when people say, why did this happen? Why does God do it that way? I don't know. All I have to know is the Bible says this is why it happens, and it happens for a reason, but we don't understand it. And I don't have to explain it. Uh, we Often we feel like, well, if we can't explain it, then there's not an answer. But I know my brain is ex- way too finite to be able to come up with those kinds of answers, and it's, un- it's unjust and unrealistic to say we ought to come up with those, those kinds of answers. Uh, we can't. But we had the general principle, and that is that God's in charge, and he recognizes this is the only way to get a resolution to the problem uh, of evil. So the creation is subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. God, that's emphasizing God is the one who brought that judgment on the creation. Because the creation itself, in verse 21, also will be delivered from the bondage of, cre- uh, of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now, we've changed our terminology again. We've gone from, from uh, the sons of God uh, earlier, which was huios, the adult sons of God, to back to children of God, which is every believer. And when we experience our true freedom from the sin nature in glorification of fa- phase three. Then we get another explanation. Paul's just explaining one thing after another. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Now, I didn't have a tremendous amount of time to do. I spent about an hour, and I kept trying to figure out where we had a meaning where where this second word indicates birth pangs, because the phrase with birth pangs does not occur in the in the original Greek. It just says we, uh, we, we gr- uh, <clears throat> groan together or mourn together and we travail together. Now, uh, the examples that I saw in the lexica that I consulted, and I have about, I don't know, six or seven on my computer, which is about all the best ones there are, never gave me any uh, usage examples of these words being used in in labor pain context. Now, that doesn't mean it's not, but um, I, I couldn't find those examples. There's not a sense of that in the passage. It's just that the whole creation groans or laments or mourns. It's an extremely picturesque word of someone who is in deep, profound grief and mourning. So again, uh, the creation is personified as as someone who is going through uh, tremendous agony over grief because of the, the what has happened to creation because of sin, and it's laboring. That is, it is in travail. It is going through constant shifts and changes. Uh, there's earthquakes and hurricanes and tornadoes and all kinds of uh, physical disasters. Uh, that take place uh, in on the, on the planet. But we know the whole creation groans and labors or mo- mourns and is in travail or is in agony together until now. Now this word, sustenazo, which is translated groaning together, the S-U at the beginning emphasizes a together. It's the uh, pre- Greek preposition soon, uh, plus the verb stenazo, and when it's combined together, it means lamenting together. But the basic core word is stenazo, which is the verb that we see showing up in two or three other verses here in this context. 
So the, not only is the whole creation going through this physical agony, but in verse 23, there's something in addition going on. And it, not only that, not only is the physical world going through this groaning, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. We who, uh, excuse me, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan, there's our word again, stenadzo, uh, we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of the body. So first of all, let's talk about this concept of the first fruits. The concept of the first fruits. This is the uh, Greek word aparke, and it is a concept that goes back to the Old Testament. And it indicates the, the beginning of something. For example, it's an agricultural term that was used to describe the, the first harvest day, the first time you went out into the fields and you were able to harvest some of the crop or some of the fruit off of the fruit trees. And it's that initial part of the harvest that was then dedicated to God in a uh, first fruit Offering. So the first fruits emphasizes something uh, of the beginning, from the beginning. Now, this first fruit is a first fruit of the Spirit, or something that's the beginning of something that is uh, of the Spirit's work. So I think that the, uh, the, the phrase there, of the Spirit, is a genitive phrase. I think it simply is uh, uh, what's called epexegetical or an explanatory of the first fruits. It, we're the beginning of the work of the Spirit. That wasn't true in the Old Testament. They didn't have the Spirit. So this is emphasizing that there's something new and fresh that's happening in the church age that is specifically going to have a role uh, an, uh, an impact in the future time when the groaning ends. Now that takes us right back to what we read in verse 17, this concept of being joint heirs with Christ. So we're, we move back and forth in Paul's thinking with the present suffering to the future uh, glorification with Christ in a environment where there's no longer any sin. So we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, it also emphasizes the idea of a, uh, of a pledge. We get this in the phrase that we find, uh, for example, in Ephesians 1.14, that the Holy Spirit, as, as the ministry of his ministry called the sealing of the Spirit, is he's called the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So their redemption is used in a future tense sense in Ephesians 1.14. Uh, Ephesians 4.30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for or until the day of redemption. So I think in both of these passages, that which is redeemed is the same thing that we have in Romans 1, which is creation, the ultimate completion of the application of God's redemptive work. He pays the price at the cross, but it's not until the, that the final part of creation is overhauled and restored to perfection that the redemption is complete. And, and that's spoken of as a future tense in terms of the day, uh, the day of redemption. So we're the first fruits, we're the beginning, but it's looking forward to the, completed, the completion of the work of the Holy Spirit. And so we read not only that, but we are also who have the first fruits of the Spirit. So it also brings into the fact that we have the fullness of the Spirit. We have all of these magnificent blessings from God the Holy Spirit, and yet we still legitimately groan. Now, we don't legitimately complain. Paul clearly knocks that out over in Ephesians 4, that we're not to complain or or, uh, or be, be embittered. But here we are to groan, we groan within ourselves. Now that's an inarticulate groaning. Some people need to have this spelled out. That means you don't have a gripe session with other Christians about how bad it is living in a fallen world. It's within yourself. It's totally silent. Now we're going to come back and have another 
concept of within yourself in just a minute. That's why I'm emphasizing this. It's inarticulate. It's not something that's spoken about. It's not something he's talked about. It's that we feel in the very core of our being that there's things that aren't right with the world today. We see wars. We see famines. We see things that go wrong on cruise ships. And we say, this just isn't right. It's a, it's, we're living in a fallen world. Bad things happen because we live in a world that is characterized by a lack of justice and righteousness. And sometimes nobody's to blame. But oh, we have to, in our arrogance, we have to go out and find somebody to blame all the time. Um, but there's no one necessarily to blame. We live in a fallen world. Everything, uh, everything we buy, everything we construct has to be painted, has to be repaired, has to be kept up. And at times it falls apart even when we keep it up, even when we paint it, cut it, fix it, repair it. Uh, it still falls apart when it's least convenient because we live in a fallen world. But we have an internal sense that it's not right. So not only that, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit... Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, uh, there's our word groaning, eagerly awaiting uh, for the adoption, the redemption of the body. Now this word eagerly awaiting means to anticipate something enthusiastically. It's an excited anticipation of something that's coming. Remember when you were about six or seven years old and you really, for the first time in your life, really understood that Christmas meant that you were going to get all kinds of goodies and you just couldn't go to sleep at night on Christmas Eve because you were going to get a bicycle or you were going to get, I don't know, an Elmo doll or whatever was popular back then. That's it. You were going to get this and you could barely contain yourself. That's how we, that's eager anticipation. That's how we are to look forward to the, to the coming of Christ. We're groaning. We have eager anticipation. But that doesn't justify. And one of the saddest things I ever heard, and I've ever heard, I've heard it on two occasions, was believers who just, they just got so tired of dealing with the garbage in the devil's world that they committed suicide just because they do, they'd be face to face with the Lord. And, and that's not the way to handle it. We have to recognize, as our Lord did, that we're living in this fallen, corrupt world for a purpose, and we have a mission in this world. And we have to engage that mission until the Lord takes us home. He's the one who decides when it's time to take us on a permanent R&R back to heaven. But until then, we eagerly wait for that R&R. We're eagerly looking forward to it, knowing that it's coming, just like a kid anticipating Christmas uh, coming uh, as those weeks and days go by prior to Christmas. We're eagerly awaiting the adoption. Now, wait a minute. This is a funny phrase here. It's wethesia, which indicates that that uh, adoption we've talked about before, that, that every believer at the instant of Christ is adopted, but this is talking about it as something future, something future. Now, we're adopted at the instant of salvation. That's clear from Galatians uh, chapters 3 and 4, dealing with the doctrine of adoption. But here, the concept of adoption is explained in this next phrase, which is an appositional phrase. It, it's when you have a word and then the next phrase uh, d- further defines the word. The adoption here is called the redemption of our body. The redemption of our body. And this is the word apolutrosis. So we have here the idea that, 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 the world is, that, that the fallen world is going to be redeemed and the body, the physical body, is going to be redeemed. And that occurs for the believer at, the resu- as, at our resurrection when we receive a new physical body that somehow is, is produced from the molecules and the chemicals of this original body. Now, the reason I say that is because the model, the only model we have for, for resurrection in a resurrection body, not... not um, the widow's son with Elisha, not um, the widow of Zarephath, not, I mean, the, the, uh, uh, not, the, um, uh, not Lazarus, 
because they were just restored to this physical life. They hadn't been dead uh, long enough for the body to go through a lot of uh, decomposition and decay. Uh, It had a little bit, but God regenerated that body and gave them uh, their life back, but it was still a physical mortal life. The only example we have of true resurrection is the Lord Jesus Christ. And on that uh, first day of the week following the crucifixion, when the disciples, when first Mary, uh, 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 Mary goes to the tomb and sees that it's empty, and then the disciples come to the tomb and see that it's empty, uh, and then Jesus appeared to them, uh, the tomb was empty because God just didn't say, poof, Jesus has a new body. The body that he had before is no longer there in the tomb. It That physical body that Jesus had in his humanity becomes what is transformed into his new spiritual body. The same, and how that happens, we don't know. It's going to be interesting because for the rest of us, we've actually gone through a long, I mean, for the most people in history, their bodies have gone through a long period of decomposition and decay. And there's not a lot left. Maybe a few bones here and there, but if they were uh, went down in a shipwreck and they were eaten by four or five different sharks, then they're just going to be spread all over the ocean eventually. Or if they get hit with a uh, 500-ton bomb right on the center of the head, there's not going to be a whole lot left of them. Uh, there's just going to be a lot of molecules scattered all over everywhere. And if people are, um, are cremated then uh, and have their ashes scattered in the Mississippi River, then those molecules are just going to be scattered all over everywhere. But I think that the God of the Bible is uh, powerful enough to, and knowledgeable enough to know where every one of those molecules are, and he's going to bring them all back together. And just think of all those believers who died before the flood, and there wasn't a whole lot left of their remains on the planet. That all got scattered and pretty much uh, destroyed. There, there, there are some people who come along and say Christians shouldn't be cremated. And they offer some silliness. Now, some of their arguments are, are a little more serious, but we, we, we lose the reality that, that we live, we have a God who can put back together what we think is impossible to put back together. And if you think that if somebody's cremated and their ashes are scattered and God can't put their body back together from those ashes, then you don't have an omnipotent or omniscient God. Now, not everybody reduces it to that superficial kind of argument, but some do. But God can can bring that body back together again. Of course, I always have the, the silly questions. You know, if I'm going to, if I die, if I were to die today and my I, you know, my, my um, eye was given to somebody for an eye transplant and liver to somebody else for a liver transplant and heart to somebody for a heart transplant. If the rapture occurs, do they get to keep the heart and the liver or do I get that back? <laughs> Sometimes we, we all engage and overthink. All right, redemption. You know, redemption is only used a few other times in uh, Romans. Uh, this word, apolytrosis, we're justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That redemption there has to do, is directly related to justification, which happens not in the future, but in the past. Uh, Ephesians 1, seven, redemption is used in reference to forgiveness. It talks about the payment of a price. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. It's the payment of a price. That occurred at the cross. Ephesians 1.14 uh, the Holy Spirit's the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of this purchase of the purchased possession. That's a future tense concept there for redemption. That's the completion of the process. And uh, Ephesians four thirty, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. So there's a past tense reality when the price was paid, and its application over time leads to an ultimate full realization of the ending of the, of the curse of sin. Now we come to verse 24. But if, uh, if we hope, here in verse 24, uh, says if for, oh, excuse me, verse 24, for we were saved in this hope. Verse 25 is an if. I skipped ahead. Uh, for we were saved in this hope. And this, again, is a reference term. It should be, it, it makes more sense if you say we were saved with reference to this hope. 
Now this is the only time in Romans that I have found the word sozo here in a past tense. Every other time, sozo is used in a future tense. Romans chapter 5, we were justified that we might be saved. Future tense. Other passages, saved has to do with glorification. This is the only time the word sozo is used in, in uh, the passages on sanctification. So here it, it seems to be used as a synonym for phase one. Sometime in the past I've said it's never used for phase one, but this could be the one exception that it's used as a synonym for that time in which we were uh, justified uh, at the point of belief in Christ. For we were saved with reference to this hope. Just like the planet is going to be uh, overhauled uh, with reference to hope. Uh, God subjected it, the corruption, with reference to hope in verse 20. We were saved with reference to that same future hope and that certain destiny. Then we see something interesting about hope. Hope that is seen is not hope. Hope is like faith. It's not based on sight. It's based on belief of something that is not seen, not felt, uh, that it's not subject to empirical verification. We're simply trusting in the promise of God. Hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? If he, you see it, it's a present reality. But hope focuses on a con- conviction of a, the certainty of a future reality. Verse 25, But if we hope for what we do not see, first class condition, and we do, but if we hope, we have confident, a confident expectation for a future destiny, which we do not see, we don't have empirical data of heaven. It doesn't matter, listen, it does not matter how many children on, how, on numerous surgical tables have out-of-body experiences claiming they went to heaven while they were under surgery and write best-selling books about it and have credibility because their daddy is some kind of a pastor. It doesn't matter how many of those incidences people talk about. That's seen. Our hope in heaven is spoken of in the Bible as an unseen reality. It's not based upon what some child comes back and tells us. In fact, if, you're, if that does anything for your Christian conviction, then I don't think you've ever learned any doctrine. Because remember what, what, what happens with, um, with Lazarus when he died and the rich man goes to torments and Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom and, and, and uh, uh, the rich man says to, to Abraham, let him, let him go back from the dead. This isn't the Lazarus who was raised from the dead, it's another Lazarus. Let him go back and tell my brothers. And Jesus said, that's not going to, I mean, Abraham said, that's not going to work because if they don't believe Moses and the prophets, they're not going to believe somebody who came back from the dead. You see, Moses and the prophets in the New Testament are enough. You don't need what some little kid writes in some best-selling book to give you extra confidence in the truth of Scripture. If you need that, then you don't have much confidence in Scripture. That's my, that's my suggestion. You need to take a long, hard look at what you really believe because Moses and the prophets and the apostles in the New Testament are enough, and they're more certain than anything that some little kid's going to tell you because he had... Uh, hallucinations under anesthesia. So we hope for what we do not see. This is a universal principle. We don't see it. We eagerly wait for it with perseverance. That means we endure suffering. Perseverance is always a term used in the scripture for hanging in there in times of suffering and adversity. Verse 26, likewise, the spirit also helps in our weaknesses, the word likewise there really emphasizes in the same way, uh, in the same kind of situation that is in adversity, the Holy Spirit helps in our weaknesses. The word for weaknesses is the Greek word asthenia. Now that's a, one of my favorite words because way back when I was just, just kind of getting out of seminary, I read a great article on uh, praying for the sick in James 5 that was one of the best written articles I'd ever read in a theological journal. 
And there it's talking about that we are to pray for the sick. But the word for sick there isn't the word for sick. It's the word asteneo, or asthenes in the noun form. And asthenes means those who are either spiritually weak or physically weak. In the Gospels, it's almost always used about 80% of the time for those who are physically weak or sick. Jesus healed the sick, the asthenes. But... There are a few times when it's used of those who are spiritually weak. When Jesus talks about the, the flesh is, uh, I mean, the uh, spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He's talking about, about spiritual, uh, spiritual inability, spiritual weakness, spiritually weir- spiritual weariness. But the uh, spirit also helps in our weaknesses. This is talking about uh, spiritual weariness in times of adversity. The word is used that way in, in James. For we do not know what we should pray as we ought. Now, I want you to pay attention to that sentence. I want you to look at that sentence, and I want you to think about that sentence. Because I would suggest that a lot of you heard me say for some of the time, we don't know what we should pray for as we ought. It doesn't say that. It makes a universal, absolute statement We, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, as creatures, do not know how to pray. That's an absolute universal statement. It's not saying we don't know how to pray in some situations. That's often how it's used. Saying we just flat, period, all the time, don't know. Why? Because the data that we do know is such a microscopic, infinitesimally small amount of all of the information that goes into why that event is happening that we really don't have a clue how to pray for it. But remember, that's not an excuse to not pray. That's not an excuse to just be general, just to generalize your prayers and say, well, God, you know what to do, so do it. Because the examples that we have in Scripture are not that way. That's why we have to study the prayers of Scripture. But the, the, the prayers of Paul and the epistles of Paul are not generalized prayers like that. They're very specific. But they're very specific in ways we can be specific. In a lot of ways, we can't be specific. Uh, we can pray for some things because we're claiming promises, just as the psalmist does. Uh, many of the psalms are prayers. But we don't know how to pray for anything as we ought. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't pray. Because we have a translator, the Holy Spirit. So we pray, and the Holy Spirit dusts off and cleans up and straightens out whatever the prayer is. So you don't have to worry about, oh, I said it wrong. Well, guess what? A lot of us say it wrong, probably, a lot of the time. The Holy Spirit cleans it up. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings uh, that cannot be uttered. And actually, the way this should be translated is with unutterable groans. The emphasis is on unutterable. It's silent. Remember earlier I talked about uh, the fact that... um, uh, that we groan within ourselves. It's not audible. This is the Holy Spirit handles it in terms of silent prayer. Now, there are those within the charismatic community who try to argue the tongues as a prayer language. And and they use this as a support for that, that it's the Holy Spirit praying with with these unutterable groans. And I say, well, they're unutterable. How come I hear it? Not only that, but if you, and I've had, I had this conversation with one, one uh, Pentecostal who said, well, when I pray in my prayer language, God answers my prayers more often. I said, really? How do you know what you pray for? Well, I don't. Well, then how do you know they're answered? We don't know how we should pray as we ought. The Holy Spirit makes intercession. Here's the word. Soon ante lambanomai, and I'm not going to say it again, that's a long word. Soon ante lambanomai means to assist or to help. 
Now, this isn't the picture. Let, let's say Jeff's over there working out uh, to unload all the heavy furniture for the uh, Camp Arete garage sale. And he comes upon this, this, this large uh, buffet, large side table. And uh, Jeff's been working out, so he, he pulls it around, manipulates it so he can bend over, and he can actually pick it up off the ground and start shuffling like an old man as he moves it forward all by himself. Now, that's the picture here in, 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 in Sunanti Limbanomai. And yet the Holy Spirit is one who comes along, and he doesn't pick, he doesn't say, okay, wait a minute, you can't carry that, I'll carry it for you. And take it, take hold of it, and carry, uh, carry the weight himself. He says, "Okay, wait a minute. I'll get this end, and you get the other end." He assists. He doesn't take it away from us. He assists us in our prayer. We pray. He assists. We don't say, "Oh, he's going to do it anyway," so I'll just go about my business and and make some generalized statement. No, that's not the idea. It's that he's going to come along and say. I'm going to take this end, you take the other end, and together uh, uh, we'll, we'll uh, make the prayer work. So he comes in as an assistant uh, to with groanings, same words, stenazo, which cannot be uttered, which are unutterable, cannot be uh, spoken there, un- inaudible groanings. This word for intercession... Um, the word for assistance was soon uh, antil and The word for intercession is only used here. Huper in Tucano, and it just means to pray on behalf of someone else. But in the next verse, we have a different word that's going to be used for intercession. Uh, now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, that he who searches the hearts is God the Father, and he knows what the mind of the Spirit is. So the Holy Spirit is one with the Father in the Trinity. They're both omniscient. And so the Father knows exactly what the Spirit is thinking. And, uh, and the, he knows the mind of the Spirit, the thinking of the Spirit, because the Spirit is making intercession for the saints. The Spirit is making intercession for the saints. And this is a different word it only by extension does it mean intercession. It's intucano, E-N-T-U-C-H-A-N-O, E-N-T-U-C-H-A-N-O. And it means to appeal, to make an appeal to someone. So the Spirit makes an appeal on behalf of the saints. Use that same word as a substitutionary term, on behalf of the saints, according to the will of God. So we pray to the best of our ability, but we pray. We don't back off. We don't say, well, I'm not really sure, so I'm just going to let the Holy Spirit handle it. We do it to the best of our ability, and then then unbeknownst to us, we don't have any idea how it happens. He sort of dusts it off, cleans it up, straightens it out, and then it goes to the throne of God. He is uh, our interceder. Inter- intercessor. Verse 34, if you skip down, also uses the same word for the Lord Jesus Christ. That verse tells us that it is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us or who also makes an appeal for us. And so both the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ intercede for us. Now that leads us up to verse 28, which says, we know that all things work together for good. In context, what are the all things in this passage? It's the suffering that we've been talking about since it was pointed out in verse 17 that we can be a joint heir with Christ if indeed we suffer with him. So when we go through all these little adversities and all the things that make us groan, we can have, claim a promise that all things, all these things that cause us to groan, will work together for good to those who love God. Now, there's various questions about that. There's some alternate readings, uh, and so we're going to have to take a look at some of the finer points in the exegesis of verse 28 when we come back next time. But now we understand the relation between groaning, who groans, 
The earth groans, the creation groans, we groan, but eventually that groaning is going to be converted into intercessory prayer to God uh, by the Holy Spirit, and eventually everything will be straightened out and evil will be destroyed at the end of the millennial kingdom. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study these things this evening and to see the important role of God the Holy Spirit in our spiritual life and and strengthening us in times of difficulty, in times of adversity, so that we know that as difficult as things appear at times, they are nothing compared with what you are producing in us uh, through your uh, work in sanctifying us and maturing us and bringing us into the image and character of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you challenge us with what we've studied this evening. In Christ's name, amen.